Uh, well, I think it's fair to say the last 18 months have been completely traumatic for the business, for our employees, for the families, everything. If you wind the clock back to the start of last year, we were actually seeing the first impact of COVID then from supply from China. And at the time, we were thinking the impact of material supply, not even thinking of a pandemic as such. Come April, we, um, we shut down basically all 22 of our factories, completely closed them. We didn't know what safe COVID protocols were. Half of those factories here in the UK, exactly. the other half? It, well, we've got India, China, Brazil, yeah. US, Russia, and we just shut everything. And they were shut for two months completely as we sort of got to grips with the supply chain, the demand, which had fallen off a cliff. Um, and then we slowly came back to production in June, July. Since then, we put safe, pro so safe uh, COVID protocols in place. You know, everyone had PPE, temperature checks. Um, still a very tough environment to come in and, and build machines in, but you know, the, the, the employees did a super job supporting it. Um, we then saw demand begin to come back. And since the third and fourth quarter last year, demand has just absolutely gone crazy. And I think it's um, a big part of what I see is governments around the world are now struggling with the economic impact of COVID. And all of them, irrespective of their political persuasion, are, are pulling the infrastructure lever as a way of boosting their economies post-COVID. Spending public money on infrastructure exactly. works, they need JCBs. Well, exactly. So we're a big beneficiary of that. At the same time, agriculture, which is about 25% of our business, is really being strong as well. Farmers, farms are getting bigger, they're more automated, more productive. Our machinery sits right in that niche of what those farmers want now. So we're seeing demand from every part of the world right now. So it's been, it's been you know, un I use the word loosely, unprecedented, genuinely has. We're sitting here now in September 2021 with four times the normal order bank we had in normal times. Wow. Going back two or three years. Such is the backlog. It is. 2020 as a whole, Graham, given that you shut down for a couple of months after COVID hit big time here in the yeah. UK, February, March 2020, but 2020 year as a whole, given the big bounce back in demand, Q3, yeah. Q4, how did it fare compared to 2019? Oh, it was way down. It was way down. And then, you know, you can't shut factories down for a quarter of the year and not and expect to recover. Um, we did... And I was a big supporter early on of the, the UK government's uh, job retention scheme. We used it for a couple of months. I think now it's gone on far too long because there is a real shortage of labour in the market generally. Um, and, and we won't see the clear picture until the end of this month when the furlough scheme finishes as to really what is the situation with supply and demand of labour. Um, but the, the overall impact on last year's results was quite dramatic. Still profitable as a business. We're you know, 76 years in business and we've always made a profit. We're very proud of that. Um, and this year has been a very, very strong bounce back. Now, viewers will know JCB as a truly iconic British company, but I've learned over the years just how global your company mm. is. You're producing 300 models, 22 factories around the world, four continents, 150 yeah. countries. Yeah. You're selling these incredible yellow machines. Let's just talk about the global side of the business for a while. Let's talk about what is incredibly your biggest market and has been your biggest market for 10 years. Yeah, India. India. Yeah. So for the first time, I think it was two or three years ago, we employed more people outside the UK than we did inside the UK. A big part of that is our Indian business. The Indian business was started um, some 40 years ago by Lord Bamford. He went to India as a young man, saw the opportunity. The market over the last 10, 15 years has really started to, to grow. And we sit there as market leader. We invested early. We've got some fantastic world-class manufacturing facilities in India. A great team, all Indian. We have a handful of expats and technical roles, but no management or, or UK expats or all Indian team. Um, and it's a business we're very proud of. We're sitting there as market leader. And it's still in a... Uh, as a market and a per capita basis, one of the smallest in the world. So the opportunity for growth in the future yeah. is still huge. Given Can, the infrastructure development requirements, huge opportunity. Every the time. mechanization of agriculture that's obviously going to happen in a yeah. booming economy. Yeah, all of that. And, and the government, Modi's government especially in the last three or four years, has really focused on infrastructure. Clearly, COVID has been a massive distraction politically and, and financially. 
but they're still talking about investing a trillion dollars, a trillion dollars in the next five years on infrastructure in India. So the, the, again, the beneficiary is construction equipment, so we're very well placed to take advantage of that. That's incredible. And you, obviously you manufacture in North America, you manufacture in Russia, as you say. Yeah. Around half then, or just over half now, your 15,000 or so employees are employed overseas. They are. To what extent do you think that benefits the UK, the fact that JCB is known in these other countries as a really good quality British manufacturer? We're still fundamentally a British company. You know, we started here, we still manufacture here, we still continue to manufacture, this is our home market. And the thing about construction equipment, it's expensive to ship around the world. So where you typically make, you sell. You, you, you rarely, unless it's a piece of compact equipment, you can t- containerize. You ship it all over the world. So making in North America and selling in North America, making in the UK, selling in Europe. So our home market being Europe and on our home manufacturing base is here, right here in Staffordshire. So we're continuing to invest in, in the UK. We see, I personally see it, you know, we've got a very highly skilled workforce here, very experienced workforce, great engineering talent coming through the business, great young talent coming through in apprenticeship schemes and graduate schemes. It's a great place to to, to work and a great place to live. So, you know, we will always attract good people to JCB here in the UK. We are here in, in Staffordshire, the JCB World Headquarters, very close to where the original stables where Joseph Cyril Bamford started the company yeah. 76 years ago. You're investing heavily on this site, aren't you? We Adding are. to the 11 factories that you have here in the UK. I think what, what the last 18 months has taught us is how quickly the market has rebounded. And I think the market will be sustained for the next probably three or four years. So we're investing in capacity, manufacturing capacity right now, and new technology and robots and laser welding machines and all sorts of technology and manufacturing because we've got to enhance our capacity. The next five years is significant growth of the business in terms of volume and revenue. We're still, you know, on a, on a global stage, a relatively small market share. So the opportunity to grow the business, even if the market remained flat, is still significant. Um, so I'm, I'm very encouraged by the future and we'll, we'll continue to invest in the UK. As I said, it's a great place to, to build machines. Tell us about the research that's going on here at JCB <clears throat> into the use of hydrogen to power big, heavy machinery. Yeah. This company has made some serious breakthroughs, right? Yeah, well, first of all, we've been making our own diesel engines since 2004, so the last 17 years. We have got a range of machines, some of the smaller machines with battery in them, and we're selling them commercially on the market right now. Um, where we differ in terms of an industry from the car industry is number, number one, the weight of our machines compared to a car, much heavier, bigger equipment typically, and the number of hours you do a year. A typical car will do 12,000 miles, maybe averaging 40 miles an hour, so that's only 300 hours a year. Our machines on a low side will be 1,000 hours a year, and it might go up to maybe three, three and a half thousand yeah. hours. There's 8,000 hours in a year, I keep on reminding yeah. people that. <laughs> so, so doing three or 4,000 hours is you know, still only half the available hours. Our customers buy machines to earn money, and they've got to have those, that equipment out there working and earning money, so hence the high hours. So battery electric is not the solution as soon as you go above a certain weight and a certain hours. So we've been exploring, and we've got to, you know, we're, we're as an industry and as a business, we're facing the, 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 the crisis uh, ahead of us in the climate, with climate change. Um, and you have prototype hydrogen driven diggers, don't you? The, we do. So we're, the we're invest- loaders, the 360. We do. So we've got, a, we've got a couple model. of machines running around with both hydrogen fuel cell technology and hydrogen combustion engine technology. And we're excited about both. It is the future. There's a lot of debate, and I'm sure you see it online, a lot of debate about hydrogen as an alternative for the future. But again, governments around the world are waking up to it. They, they all typically have hydrogen strategies. Hydrogen at the moment in the, for green hydrogen is expensive to manufacture, but that cost will come down. And, and no, there's no silver bullet solution for anything. You know, batteries, a point of use is zero emissions. Everyone gets that. But if you go in the, back in the supply chain to a lithium mine making for the batteries, it's not the most environmentally, environmentally friendly uh, solution. So, and the lithium's often in difficult, politically v- turbulent exactly, places. Exactly, exactly. So there's, 
I said, there's no silver bullet to any answer for any industry. So you've got this in, these incredible hydrogen-driven prototypes, which, which I've been privileged to see, um, and they, you know, talking to the people operating, they drive and operate just like a regular diesel-powered JCB. How soon, Graham, till the <laughs> prototype is available for general use on the market? It will be a year, a couple of years, okay. I think. We're, well, first of all, the hydrogen combustion engine. You know, the, the combustion engine itself, sadly, over the last few years has been demonised. And it's been demonised because of what's happened in the car industry with certain companies cheating on emissions. Yeah. And it's not the combustion engine's fault, it's the fact it's fossil fuels. If you got rid of the fossil fuels and get zero CO2 emissions or zero emissions, then, you know, the, the basic technology of a combustion engine is, is very apt for the future. Uh, there's still big challenges on, as I said, the cost of hydrogen production, hydrogen distribution, but these are challenges that we will overcome in the future. Um, so I, I can see it being available commercially fairly soon, but in terms of volume production, I think we're a few years off that yet. Tell us a little bit more about um, here in the UK. What's your general view about the outlook for the UK economy? We're going into an autumn, there's an awful lot of uncertainty. Yeah. You will be thinking very deeply about this market. Builders, construction industry, they're famously bellwether indicators yeah. of what's going forward in the economy. What do you think of the prospects for UK growth and in turn for JCB sales in the UK over the next three to six months? We're sold out. So I'm very optimistic. You know, if you wanted to buy a machine today, depending on what type, the earliest I could make it is probably May next year. Wow. So, and when I look. Big looked, demand. Uh, big demand, and, and, it's no, and it's not artificial. Sometimes people say, well, that people panic buy or panic yeah. order, but there's, when I actually interrogate the orders we've got, they've all got customer names to them. They've all got work behind them. Um, so I'm very optimistic. I think there's a number of potential threats, you know, whether we have a, another wave of COVID, which has a, an impact on, on uh, people's confidence in the economy. That could well happen, but the government, I think, are on top of that. And I think we've just got to crack on with, with the economy and with business. Um, so the, and, and the other big risk, I think, is inflation. You know, inflation is running on, on the basket of goods measured by the government, still about 3 or 4%. Reality to our business, since the 1st of January, steel has doubled. It's gone from 560 euros a tonne to 1,100 euros a tonne. And you use a lot of steel. We use 600,000 tonnes a year. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you can do the math pretty quick. Um, so inflation is a real threat. Um, you see a lot of inflation in the supply amount, chain. Huge amount, huge amount. And it's, so it's, these headline figures, CPI, 2, 2.5%, two oh, retail price index, as you say, 3, 3.5%, three three that more. isn't really what's happening no, in the economy. Not, not in, when you look at industry and what yeah. we buy, be it raw material steel or components, hydraulic components, electric components, microprocessor shortages, booting prices up, the prices were crazy, logistics costs. Uh, a container from China was $2,500, uh, at the end of last year, it's now $11,000 to ship a container from Shanghai to Europe. So all of those costs have got to feed through into the economy. And, and yes, we're passing some of that onto our customers and they're passing it on to their end customers as well. So that's just going to push inflation and price of building and, and any, even doing any sort of DIY at home, you try and get a builder today. You think that's the biggest threat to the UK economy now, inflation? I think it is. I really do think. And I don't think it's just a UK issue. It's a worldwide issue. I think we, we haven't gone through a, an inflationary period for many, many years. And I, I think a lot of people can't even remember what it was like um, 20, 30 years ago, but I think we're heading back in that way. So that, that's got to be you know, in the psyche of what's going on with, with business right now. Let's talk a little bit about labour with a, with a small L, the workforce, <laughs> the British workforce. Um, you obviously employ many, many skilled yeah. workers here. You train many skilled yeah. workers. You've got the wonderful JCB Academy yeah. just close to this site where yeah. you bring on young uh, engineers, many of whom end up yeah. as workers here. I know you're very, very positive about the British workforce, and that's why JCB is so committed to staying in the UK, and, and this will always be your headquarters and the epicenter, if you like, of your production. Um, but tell us about the shortage of skills when you're trying to employ people yeah. for your production lines. Um, and tell us how you think the furlough scheme now 
is influencing the availability of labour for major employers like yourself? If we wind, wind right back, it starts with education. You touched upon it, we've got the JCB Academy, but I think the UK government has really got to look at the education system and, and really encourage maths, engineering, technical subjects, and, and there's been a lack of that certainly over the last 10, 15 years. Um, we opened the JCB Academy, which is a mile from here, 14 to 18 year old kids coming through, girls and boys, and the talent we come out, that come out of that's fantastic. A regular school, but with a real emphasis it's, it's, it's on a, engineering It's a subjects. regular government funded school. It's not yeah. private school, it's a yeah. government funded school. Um, and, and it's a real emphasis and massively on... massively oversubscribed. Hugely oversubscribed. Huge, and we're trying to encourage more and more girls to go into it as well. Uh, unfortunately, we're not allowed to positively discriminate on getting the girls in there. So, um, no, it's, it's a great foundation for, for the young people. We then have our apprentice schemes. We have graduate schemes. Um, so the long-term engineering base, I think, is good if the government can really refocus the education system on the STEM subjects. In terms of the skilled labour for, for manual type jobs, I think the furlough scheme has, has masked a lot of what's going on. There's a shortage of labour right now, no doubt about it. Um, and why would you, you know, if you're sitting at home on 80% of your salary, risk coming along and changing work when you know you're going to get paid for another however long? I think when that finally does finish, and it at should the end have, of this month, and it should have finished long ago in my opinion, and there may well be industries where there is a lot of unemployment, but there's plenty of opportunity as well. There's more job vacancies here in the UK than there has been, I think, for many, many years, for, I think since records began. And, and we, are, we, we can see it right now. We're trying to recruit people into the factory and we're offering very competitive salaries is, is a challenge. Really are you can. having to up your... We are having salary that you offer to get the workers that you want at the moment. Well, we've always been a, an employer in the uh, top quartile in terms of pay, and we'll always be there. But when you're seeing the likes of some big logistics providers, even an Amazon warehouse down the road, uh, offering a thousand pound sign-on bonus for a warehouse operator, that becomes quite you know challenging to compete with. So we're having to be quite innovative in terms of what we offer in terms of basic pay, shift patterns, overtime allowances. So. When people come and work for JCB, they're paid very, very well. They can earn very good salaries. Um, and when they come, there's, they stay. <laughs> We've got a lot of long-serving people. So our, our attrition rate is very low as well. That's something we're proud of as well. Of course, one person's inflation and, uh, 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 and wage cost increase is another person's, hopefully, better standard of living. As long as this wage signal that's happening leads to an increase in the supply of skilled people, yes. right? Uh, do you think we can get there? Do you think the government takes that seriously? We always have endless skills and training schemes. It's like the perennial Cinderella subject of politics, isn't it? I don't think they take it seriously enough. Definitely not. You know, they've got to, the government have got to keep on reminding themselves manufacturing as a percentage of the UK economy is still significant. Yes, it's not what it was 30 or 40 years ago, but manufacturing isn't either. There's a lot more automated, automation, a lot more production uh, technology in there now. Um, so the government have got to wake up and take this very seriously if they want the UK to remain a manufacturing hub. I think it's a great opportunity post-Brexit that we can sort of disentangle ourselves from a lot of the regulation. Uh, we have had some challenges, no doubt about it, with, with um, labour that used to come in from Poland and the, a lot of them, lot of the welders especially, are very, very high-skilled welders in, in Poland. I've gone back there, so we're trying to... They may return. A lot of these guys well got do. leave to remain, right? Exactly, exactly. They may um, have gone to spend the COVID period with yeah, their families. Yeah, but there's the whole immigration issue now of getting you know, our licences to bring in immig immigrants with a skill, skill level, and that's something the government have got to look at. It's no good just saying we'll employ British people if they're, if they're not out there if they're sitting at home on furlough. We've got to have a government with a joined up thinking of, of a very clear industrial policy linked with an education policy, linked with a skills policy. And that's what's missing right now. We are still a manufacturing power. We're still in the top 10 manufacturers yep. around the world. But are we still a world-class manufacturer? Oh, absolutely Graham? we are. Absolutely we are. Um, I think private investment's driving that rather than you know, government incentives, but we are. You know, when you look at the, the top scientists on hydrogen, they're, they're here in the, in the UK. We've got some absolutely brilliant companies around the UK. It's something we, we mustn't 
we mustn't forget our engineering and science base here in terms of the universities that produce some of the best engineers and scientists in the world. So absolutely we are, and we mustn't, we mustn't diminish ourselves. We must, we've got to stop putting ourselves down. I think that's a British, very British trait to do that. Now, people listening to this interview may think, well, JCB's great. Where can I buy the shares? Of course, they can't buy shares in <laughs> JCB because you're, you're, you're a private company, you're a family-owned company, yeah. owned by the Bamford family, yeah. the direct descendants of Joseph Cyril Bamford. But that aside, what do you think JCB means for the UK? The image of JCB, what it stands for, I mean, it's, the it's brand? A, it's an interesting question because when you sit inside the organisation looking out, it's probably very different from outside looking in. Uh, you know, we're, we're very proud of what we do locally. You know, we, when we talk, okay, we, yes, we are a family-owned company, but we're genuinely a family company. You know, our employees, our dealers, our suppliers, you know, we, we, we typically take a very long-term view on things in terms of investments. It's a massive plus being privately owned. You know, we don't have to, of course, you're under pressure to deliver results, but we're not under, you know, quarterly pressures on share price. If we decide to invest on something that's not going to be delivered in five years' time, then we'll do it. You can it. take a longer-term view. Much longer-term view. So that's a massive positive. Um, I mean, it's a difficult question for me to ask in terms of the perception of JCB. You know, we are... When, when, when I meet a stranger and they say, what do you do for a living? I say, I, wa I work for a construction equipment company <laughs> called, called JCB. Have you heard of it? Well, I, I don't quite say that. And they all go, well, of course I've heard of JCB. But, I, you know, I don't think that way because, you know, we, we can't think that way. We can't be arrogant about who we are. You know, we, we're, you know, we're a very grounded company. We're a very nimble company. Yes, we're a big organisation now, but, you know, we're not bureaucratic. We don't have committees for everything. There are a handful of people that make all the decisions and we can make decisions very quickly. And that's a great advantage. You've mentioned Brexit, Graham. Um, JCB is one of the leading sort of global brands of this country. Where do you think Britain's place will be in this global economy going forward? There's a lot of talk about global Britain. A lot of people deride the idea of oh, global yeah. Britain, a hark back to the days of, of empire or whatever. Um, but how... As somebody who travels around the world a lot, who oversees 15,000 employees, many of them in other continents, how real do you think that image of global Britain is? I think it's very real and it's getting better. I think, honestly, of all the politicians right now doing a good job is Liz Truss. I think she's gone out there, she's done great trade deals and we need to, we need to big that up because over the last decade, Europe is a market for construction equipment was shrinking very quickly as a percentage of the overall market. All the growth was coming elsewhere in the world. And we were being not necessarily held back, but we were certainly being stymied by some of the rules and regulations that we were burdened by. You know, we've got an opportunity to go and do a trade deal with any country in the world. And you know Now we're outside we're, the EU. Now we're outside the EU. We're not we're not constrained by by all the the EU uh, relationships and, and trade deals were already in existence. So I think the government are doing a good job and that we can always do more. And, uh, but again, there's so much going on in the news right now. I think it's been a distraction away from the fundamentals. Let's get back on trade. Let's get back on education. Let's get back on, on industrial policy. That's what's, that's what's important to the economy. So you mentioned the trade secretary there. She has signed lots of trade deals. Some of them are so-called rollover deals, yeah, yeah. deals the EU already yeah. Which was important. Which with, was, with, we, and now they're UK specific deals, yeah. other deals are, are fresh deals. As a major exporter from this country, will those deals really help you? Try to, try to explain to viewers why a trade deal can be important for a company like you. Well, there's certain economies that are still quite protectionist of, of themselves. So if we, if we import a machine from here to, say, Brazil uh, that's made in the UK, there's some significant import duties on that. And, and even though not vice versa. So we've got to have you know, trade deals between the UK and con countries like Brazil, which is a fast growing economy. Mm. Lots of challenges mm. in Brazil, lots of challenges, but you know, we can have a trade deal where we have free trade that we can sell into that market without import duties, without in in tariffs. And that then opens up huge opportunities for the UK as an exporter. And, and under EU, that was not happening. That was not happening. So the opportunity is, is huge and you know, basic things like import duties and tariffs. And we, 
sadly, we got caught up, bizarrely, now we're out of it, in the Airbus-Boeing trade dispute that was going on between the EU and the, and the US. And all of a sudden, construction equipment got... got as a sub- pawn in a which, much which bigger was, game. Which was bizarre. We, yeah. we knew nothing about it. All of a yeah. sudden, we had 20% import duties in some of our machines. Not all of them, some going into the yeah. US. Now, that's common sense has prevailed, and that's now been, been closed off and we're out of that. But these are sort of things that we've got to have individual trade deals, not be sucked into other disputes that are going on between a French manufacturer and an American manufacturer. Um, so there's lots of pluses of having individual trade deals between the UK and, and all the countries and governments around the world. Just a final question, Graham, if I may. What would you say to young people who are watching this interview? Here you are, you're the CEO of, of, <laughs> of JCB, you're working in the heart of British manufacturing, what would you say to them if they're thinking about uh, trying to make a career yeah. in this sector? It's not always the most fashionable sector, is it? I, I disagree. I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I joined JCB when I, well, I was going to say it was 26 years ago uh, in the factory. I a child. Design. Well, no, not quite. Um, but I never, you know, the, what I always say to graduates who are coming in and young people who think about a career, is a company like JCB, we are global. So you're not joining a company which is maybe a UK-based company, or you're not joining a company where, as an engineer, you're given a wing mirror to design for the rest of your career. You're coming in, you could give, be given, you're going to send you to Brazil tomorrow. They're going to send you to Russia tomorrow or India tomorrow. The, the opportunity, or you're an engineer, you're going to go into sales or go into production. The opportunity for a, a really interesting, exciting career is enormous. And we're growing. So it's only going to get more and more. And we need, you know, I need, you know, a team around me who are coming through the levels who are going to be succeeding me in the future. So we typically always, probably 95% promote from within as well. So, you know, the, the career opportunities of stepping up are, are enormous. So come and join us, please. Graham McDonald, thanks a lot for joining us on GB News. Pleasure. Thank you.